If you have a Bible, I want to welcome you uh, or invite you to grab one. Mark chapter 12, just a couple, actually maybe one more week in chapter 12, and we dive into 13, and we'll spend quite a bit of time in that chapter. Mark chapter 12, if you don't own a Bible, we have some paperback uh, copies out in the lobby. Feel free to grab one. It's a gift to you, or you could follow along with us on the screen above me. We're going to pick it up in verse 28 and go to verse 34. Very familiar passage, uh, one in which we are all familiar with, um, and one in which I can go in a number of directions, but I'm going to try to stick with my plan here. Mark 12, 28, if you're there, say amen. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one. And there is no other besides him and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Let's pray over the reading of God's word this morning. So Lord, we thank you for your word that just spoke directly to our hearts and is posing yet again many questions to us this morning. And we pray, Lord, that as we go through this, that we would see you clearly, give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear, give us a heart to receive, Show us ourselves, but more importantly, show us our Savior. It is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. There's a phrase that stands out to me in this passage, uh, and it's when Jesus says, if you look back in verse 34, that last verse we read, when he tells the scribe, he says, uh, you are not far from the kingdom of God. I think about all the ways in which you can get very close to something, yet you not experience that something. When I think about this verse, you are not far from the kingdom of God. It's like, if anybody football fans in here? Two, great. All right, so the rest of you just nod along as I give this analogy. You are on the one-yard line about to step into the end zone. You are close, but you're not close enough. And if, so I'm from the South, and I have a, you know, we're big college football fans. And, and, and if you're an Auburn fan like myself, this is the story of being a fan of Auburn football. We are close, but we're not close enough. We've been very close on many occasions. Well, there was this one time where we weren't close. We actually won. It was a game against Alabama, our arch nemesis, right? Like we hate Bama, roll tide, like roll tide down the toilet is what I got to say to that. And so, and so it's the Iron Bowl of 2013, 28 to 28, All Saban's got to do is get his boys to kick the field goal and they win the game with one second left. But the problem is, is that Saban has a history with not having the best kickers on his team. And so with Chris Davis from Auburn in the end zone, knowing that they were far, they were way too far to get this field goal. 
He had anticipated. It's like this dude had like this ESP. He knew they were going to kick the ball directly to him, and he took the ball because the dude missed and ran it for 109 yards, and Auburn won the game. Alabama was close for once, but not close enough, and they lost. But then Auburn went on to the national championship, and they got close to winning, but they weren't close enough. I wonder if that's the story of some of us, if we've ever been in that situation where we have been so close, close in a relationship, close with a certain job, close with something in your life, and you kind of feel the weight of this. You've been far, but you're just, you're you're close, but you're just not close enough. I, I wonder if this is what Jesus is saying when he tells the man, he says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And essentially what he says to him, he says, scribe, listen, you're close, but you're not close enough. Maybe that resonates with some of us this morning as we think about how we have put our trust in ourselves, yet we say the language of Jesus, but we're trusting in ourselves as the savior of our own lives. What Jesus would say to you is the same thing he would say to this This man, you're close, but you're not close enough. If we think about the context of the story that we are in, we're thinking about, and really, if you've been following along throughout the whole gospel of Mark, it's been this theme of the kingdom of God is here. It's not some spatial thing. It's not some geographical thing. It's that the kingdom of God is now present in Jesus, the king. And on that account, he asked his listeners to do a couple of things. That if the kingdom of God is here and it's being fulfilled and it's, and it's right here in Jesus, the king, then he commands and he demands his listeners to do a couple of things. And what were those things? Repent and believe, repent of your sins, and then believe, have faith that Jesus Christ is the king and the savior and the Messiah He has displayed this kingship throughout all. And this is what he's been doing. He's been doing this this work throughout the Gospels where he he is dominating over all aspects of the universe and displaying how the kingdom is here, that King Jesus is setting his authority and his rulership here on earth now. And how do we know this? Well, he comes and he speaks to the winds and his waves, and he tells them that you're not allowed to do what you're doing. What is he doing? Displaying that he is ruler over all things of nature. And he does this even in the manner of our own lives when he speaks to people who are sick and he calls them to be healed. He is displaying that he is Lord over all things and over all sicknesses and diseases. Uh, In other words, that he is Lord over the things that have broken the realms of creation. And we also see this in how he speaks to demonic, like these possessed people, men who are plagued by demonic possession and he displays that he's not over only just setting his kingship over nature over humanity but even over the realm of darkness when he tells the demoniac that you're not allowed to be in this man get out is the display of this type of kingship of this kingdom of god is here now and it's here in the person and deity of Jesus Christ. And by way of all of this background, we should insert ourselves into the dialogue that is happening before our eyes in our ears. The question that is posed here, and if you look at this back in verse 28, one of the scribes, presumably part of the group that he was just a part of, that just a question, maybe he's on the fringe of this group and maybe he's been listening how Jesus has just been like, just hitting some home runs with his answers uh, to these people. And he comes with a question of his own. This question posed to Jesus doesn't seem to be convoluted as the previous question was. If you remember, you got to go back and read that, that last paragraph where the, the, the Sadducees were questioning Jesus about resurrection and a woman who had like 18 husbands and they all dead and she died. Which one's she going to be with? And it was just this weird question where they were trying to trap Jesus. But this is different, isn't it? 
This is a straightforward, seemingly sincere on the surface about his genuine intention to understand what, what do I need to do in order to, to kind of recalibrate my life so that I am made right with God. I mean, on the surface, there doesn't seem anything wrong with that. Seems like he's asking a fairly decent question. Because the first questions that Jesus, these previous questions that Jesus has been, been asked has been like, I'm going to listen to what you say, but then I'm going to argue against everything you're saying. I, 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 and I got a confession to make that when I was a student in high school, I didn't care what the teacher was teaching, but if she said something that, that piqued my interest, I wanted to argue with the teacher. Maybe that's you, maybe, may, or maybe some of you teachers in the room have those students and you don't like those students. This is the people that Jesus has. They're there to listen to the audible word of God, but they're not there to receive. They're not there to actually kind of have the word kind of search their life. They're there to argue with Jesus, but it doesn't seem so with this particular scribe. This scribe has a genuine question. Now, just a little bit more of some context. The, the question asked by the scribe, he is an expert of the law. Now, the Pharisees, and this is just by way of passing, and, and you don't have to memorize this kind of stuff, but this is the kind of stuff that, that uh, makes me a little excited and giddy in my brain. There were 613 precepts, or, or we would just call them laws to, to better our understanding. Now, 248 of those we're in kind of a category of these are positive things. But the other side of that, which was at least 365 precepts, were prohibitions. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. If you look at that person wrong way, then just gouge your eye out. I mean, just, just crazy kind of things that were happening. And the Pharisees would focus more on these things and impose these prohibitions to where the people did not have a shepherd who was leading them in a genuine, loving way. But in turn, it was filled with um, a religious establishment leading with legalism. And so with all of that in mind, let's hear what Jesus has to say, because it's very interesting in Jesus's response to the man. He gives a clear answer to the question, and it's, and it's wonderful. Just notice it there. Jesus answers him with his clarity. Well, I'll tell you what's most important, and it's this. Here's what's most important. And so he goes back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. All right, we call this the Shema. It is the Shema which every Jewish person would have memorized. In, in the Orthodox Jewish community, this is what is quoted out loud verbatim. And Jesus gives it to him. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then he goes on from an example from the Shema in, in, in which every listener would have understood and, 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 and understood rightly. And Jesus says, I'll answer this question. And here's the commandment by which you need to know. And you shall love the Lord God. Now notice the alls, all right? With all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. What is this? This is for the listener to hear that we are to be devoted to God or it's this devoted love to God that dominates every single aspect of our life. That's what he says when he's t saying all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. It is not some um, fuzzy feeling in your belly. It is not some experience that you just had that gave you goosebumps type of love. It is an all-encompassing, fully devoted type of love that covers every realm of your life, of your thinking, of your soul, of your strength, every aspect of it. And I'm not going to belabor all of this because we've heard these sermons before and we've heard the sermon, sermons where they'll go into this point where they say, and here's how five ways you love God. 
right? You've heard those sermons before, haven't you? Okay, you haven't? Well, maybe I'll give you one right now, but that's, I don't have time for that. But notice what he says. All your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And then notice what he says after that. Because he's going to give you the, the second wing of the airplane. There's one wing, love the Lord your God. And then the other part of that, which is keeping you afloat, is a love for neighbor. Jesus says, I'll add to this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Pretty straightforward, isn't it? Pretty straightforward. Here it is. All, 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 all. Love your neighbor. I mean, that's it. It just seems like at this point, okay, I think I can do that. Maybe. Unless you're like me. And you feel a heavy burden all of a sudden come over your soul. And you say, wait a minute. I haven't loved God with all my mind. I haven't loved God with all my soul. I haven't loved God with all of my might. So what am I supposed to do? Well, before he even gets there, um, he says this. So not only are you loving your neighbor, but you're loving your neighbor as yourself. Now, this is not an emphasis, and this is where I would disagree with so many sermons I've heard on this thing. Many people would just place like this overemphasis with this type of, well, you can't get to the love of neighbor until you have this idea of self-love, self-esteem. Take care of you first, boo-boo. Isn't that what culture tells you to do? Oh, you've got to just make sure you are taken care of. Don't think about loving others until you, are, you, you go through the self-care rituals. You know, you go get your mani and your patty and whatever uh, those things are called. I mean, I'm biting my finger and you tell I really don't know. Uh, you know, just go, go get your self-care. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a man-centric focus that the Bible is not really suggesting that is there. Note that the Lord did not say, you shall be able to love your neighbor when you learn to love yourself. He doesn't say that. Nor does our Lord Jesus say, love your neighbor from the source of your self-love or your self-respect. I don't know why we view these things in such this way. But what Christ said is, love your neighbor as yourself or like you have loved yourself. Because there is this instinct inside of all of us, when we're threatened, we've got to take care of ourselves, And so that is the ground in which we begin to love others. It isn't this garbage of go take care of yourself before you go love other people. Like just, that's just baloney. And I don't, anyway, that was all free 99. I really overemphasizing something here. Now, notice what happens here. The scribe is going to restate exactly what Jesus says with a few overemphasis in in his restatement. And he says to him, and notice what he says. You are right, teacher. Right? So he says, you are right, teacher. We'll get back to that that point in just a second. Love your God with all your heart, with all your understanding. Now, Jesus said mind. In the Greek, they're two separate words, but I don't think it means anything different. So that's just by way of passing. It's love your God with all your mind, with all your strength, love your neighbor uh, uh, as yourself. But notice that he both precedes that and he follows that with an emphasis that he draws out of again with the Shema, which he quoted here at the end of 29. So he's not just overemphasizing this universal type obligation that we all have towards God and our neighbor, but he's, he's emphasizing two different things here. The first one that he's emphasizing is the uniqueness of God. The uniqueness of God. The idea that there is one God, or, or maybe not just the uniqueness of God, but in the uniqueness of God is the oneness of God. That God is one. That is the reason why that we have the law in the first few Ten Commandments that says, love the Lord your God. Like, do not have any other idols, false gods before me, because there's just one. 
It's why in Isaiah chapter 45, there is no other God besides me, nor were there one before me or after me. It is this beautiful thing that we get, that we draw from our doctrines of the Trinity, that there is one God, that there is just one God. And he is affirming this oneness of God. One God in three persons, three persons and one God. And he's affirming this. And it's just as the people, when Isaiah wrote that in Isaiah 45, 600 years before Jesus, just as people had problems with the idea of the oneness of God 600 years before Jesus came. And is it any different 2,100 years after Jesus came? Do we not still have a problem with the oneness of God, that there is just one God? There is a plurality of God. There is one God and there is none other. And he is affirming that before there was time and after there will be anything, there will be just one God in the beginning, God. And what is the greatest commandment, he says? Love the one God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. It's the all, all, all. But notice how the other thing that he draws out, he mentions... Uh, the sacrificial type uh, element of this. It is not that the scribe is diluting the need for a sacrifice. I mean, they understood the sacrificial system was a big deal. I don't have time to get into all that. But that was a big deal to them. This was how they were atoning for sins that had been committed was through the sacrificial system. So he's not saying that there's not a need of the sacrificial system. He's saying that the sacrificial system becomes irrelevant the moment when we have a disobedient heart towards this one and true God. Now notice what Jesus says, and, I, and I'll, I'll be, I'm going to get to a couple of things here in just a second, but I got to notice what Jesus says right here. And Jesus answers him and he says to him, you've answered wisely, or you, you're right, all right? You're correct in what you're saying. Just remember and the questions that's been posed to Jesus so far. Jesus has tell them, no, you ain't right. In fact, you're wrong. In fact, if you remember last week, he tells the Sadducees who kind of, uh, you know, like they were known for their knowledge of the Torah. And Jesus looks at them and tells them, you don't know the word would have been a slap to their faces and their pride and their ego. But notice Jesus' response is a little different, but then there seems to be an indictment even on this young man's heart. He says, you're right, but you are not far from the kingdom of God. You're right there on the one yard line, You're right there on the border. You are about to make the touchdown and get into the kingdom of God. Jesus looks at this scribe and he says, you're close, but you're not close enough. Now, for us as the observer, for the religious people around or the disciples who are observing, listening intently to every single one of Jesus' words, they're probably thinking then, oh, oh, insert explicit word right there. How are we going to get into the kingdom of God? Will Jesus then look at me and tell me, welcome, welcome, You're close, but you're not close enough. There's another realm waiting for you. What are we to do with this? It reminds me of, if you think back of the young, rich ruler in chapter 10. He's got the pedigree. He's got the theological background. He's young. He's a good-looking chap. Everybody wants him on their team. He walks in the Refuge City Church, and we all say, there's the next leader and pastor 
of this church because he looks and dresses and says all the right things, but Jesus tells him, you're close, but you're not close enough. Why for this young rich ruler? Because this young man had a love for his money and it was his love for an idol that kept him on the one yard line and from keeping him into the end zone. And so the disciples say to Jesus, then who gets in? How do they get in? And remember Jesus' response? What is impossible with man is possible with God. For with God, all things are possible. In other words, Jesus is deconstructing a view among the religious establishment that says, for those of you who look the part and for those of you who act the part and you've got the Torah memorized, you've got the Shema memorized and you have got it all nailed down. You're missing one element. Notice what the scribe says to Jesus after Jesus says to him this answer. He says, you are right. Who does he call him? Teacher. This man wanted Jesus to be just the teacher and not what Jesus' intention was for him to come. This man saw him as teacher and this man could not see him as savior. And because he could not see him as savior, Jesus looks at this young scribe and he tells him, you're close, but you're not close enough. It is when the heralding angels broke through the heavens in the early gospel and they heralded the good news, fear not, for unto you, is born in the city of David, a teacher, a good example. Is that what they said? They break open the skies and they look down upon the shepherds and they say, fear not for to you today in the city of David is born the savior of the world. It is why we can come in here on a Sunday and be like the scribe when, when, when we say we're just looking for a teacher, we're looking for a good example, we're looking just for someone to modify my behavior just a little bit. And, and that, now, isn't that, in, isn't that the world that we live in in Utah? Right? So, so, so here's the world we live in in Utah where, where there are Tons of rich, young rulers. There are tons of these scribes who are saying, just tell me what I need to do to check off my list so that I would be made right before God. And so we'll do that. We'll play the part. We'll make ourselves look good. We'll be like the young rich ruler. I don't think we have any rich rulers in this place. Uh, and if not, you're not tithing. Uh, but, but like we have, we, have, we have all these people who are trying to, trying to make themselves look good, right? And we think that if I can look good, that if I can just abide by the most important law, then God would look at me with happiness, And that he would be so proud of the person that I've become. But unless our religion shows us our need for God, then our religion will actually become a barrier between us and God. And we will be like the man and Jesus will look at you and say, you're close, but you're not close enough. This man wanted the number one thing to do, the number one thing that I can check off so that I can be viewed by God as righteous. And he misses the most important part of this when he identifies Jesus as teacher and not savior. Jesus is just the example and he's not savior. And he didn't come to be an example. He didn't come to just teach. He came to save Yeshua, Jesus. 
comes and he steps out of the realms of his kingdom of heaven and ushers in his kingdom rule on the earth, not as an example for us, not as a good teacher for us, so that he would save you from yourself and save you from the pits of hell. That's why Jesus came. And the, and the scribe couldn't see it. The scribe couldn't receive it. The scribe, he's, 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 he's wanting to know, what is that one thing? But he couldn't see it in front of him. Because the question wasn't, what do I need to do? The question was, can I just receive who you are, Christ? That's the question. And he misses it. That's why Jesus can look at the scribe and say to him, you're close, but you're not close enough. It's the most beautiful thing about Christianity is that you don't have to ask the question, what do I do? Because all you have to do is receive. What do I receive? What do I receive? Which is what? The kingdom. How? Repent and believe. That's what you have to do. To recognize that when I look at all, 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 do you know what it does? It condemns me. You know why? Because I will never be able to love God with my all, all, all. Oh, but there's the beauty of the gospel. That there would be a man who would come and do the all, 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 all on your behalf. And would meet the standards of all of the laws in your place that would be condemned as a perfect, sinless Savior in your place. And so if the love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with everything you've got, if it doesn't condemn you, then you have fallen into a works-based theology that says, I'll just do the bare minimums to get myself by. And it is damning. It's the beauty of the gospel when the Savior passes by and he says, for whoever would come to me, for whoever would repent, for whoever would believe. Can it be that easy? Well, it is that easy and it is also that difficult. It is easy to view him as savior, but it is also very difficult to not view myself as savior. See what it is that keeps you from saying Christ as savior. And for many of us, this is not all of us, this is some of us. For some of us who what that keeps us from saying Christ as Savior isn't that we're bad, isn't that we're doing terrible things, it's that we think we're too good to need a Savior. It's because we think we have it all together. We don't need a Savior. And again, I have to just kind of draw this back to a close by way of what I said in the beginning. We could look at this and easily say, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you five ways to love God. Number one. Number two. And then when we're done with that, I'll tell you, well, and then, and then here's five ways to love your neighbor. Number one, get the vaccine. Okay, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. But, but isn't that what they told you? That's love of neighbor. Second hesitations, right? It's a misconstruing of this text. This text isn't supposed to be a... Five ways to love God. Five ways to love your neighbor. It is to reveal to you that you'll never be able to meet up to that standard. 
So what's the way out? You look to Jesus. You look to Christ because he met all the standards. He abided by all the laws in a way that in which we could not have ever accomplished. If the law here is expressed, love God and love your neighbor. If it doesn't realize in your own self how needy you are, then the law itself will become a barrier for you. And Jesus will look at you and say, you were close, but you're not close enough. And so may the word of God reveal to you your need of trusting in someone else who could say, I did the all, 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 all for you.